Good afternoon and welcome to the second installment of RPA's palliative care series, Implementing Medical Management Without Dialysis for Seriously Ill Older CKD Patients. We appreciate you taking time out of your schedule to join us. This webinar is being presented by Dr. Woody Moss from West Virginia University Health Sciences Center and Dr. Dale Lupu from Georgetown Washington University. During the presentation, please feel free to submit your questions in the Q&A box as we have a lot of time at the end to answer your questions. Now I'll turn it over to our esteemed presenters, Drs. Woody Moss and Del Lupu. Hi, good afternoon. Uh, I think I probably know many of you. I am a nephrologist who's also board certified in palliative medicine. So I, I call myself a palliative care nephrologist, just like we know transplant nephrologists and interventional nephrologists. And uh, Dale and I are going to share a lot of our findings uh, from this Pathways Project. But before we get into that, Dale, how about if you introduce yourself? Unmute. Thank you. Yes, I'm just trying to click it. Dale Lupu, I'm faculty at George Washington University. My background's in public health, and I've worked for many decades in getting hospice and palliative care more available. And Woody and I teamed up close to a decade ago to try to build bridges, more bridges between nephrology and palliative care. So really looking forward to telling you about what we developed and learned about active medical management without dialysis. And I should tell you that the Gordon and Betty Moore Foundation funded our really two, two and a half year project uh, to improve uh, kidney supportive care for patients with advanced chronic kidney disease and patients on dialysis. Our objectives for today are to describe the patient population preferring, we're going to call it AMMWD, uh, active medical management without dialysis. Patients prefer that term to conservative care or conservative kidney management. They think that conservative sounds like we're not really doing very much for them and they like something that's active. Uh, we're gonna discuss for whom survival with active medical management is, compa is comparable to that with dialysis. We're gonna explain how offering this option promotes value-based kidney care. And we're gonna identify some barriers, some challenges and approaches uh, to implementing uh, chronic kidney care. Did you? Okay. So uh, first let's talk about terminology though. Uh, I, I sort of told you about active medical management without dialysis, but in the literature, it's been referred to five or six different ways. And that's actually part of the problem is that we're not using consistent terminology. It's been considered maximal conservative care, when KDGO met in 2013, they decided they like comprehensive conservative care. It's called conservative management. The uh, Alberta program in Canada that Sarah Davison, Dr. Sarah Davison, Canadian nephrologist heads, they call it conservative kidney management. And then in Australia, Mark Brown and his team at New South Wales calls it renal supportive care. So a lot of different names for basically an approach to treating patients with advanced chronic kidney disease and stage kidney disease without dialysis. So just to start with, we thought we'd ask a couple of questions. How many patients do you typically have at any one time on active medical management without dialysis in your practice? And the options are none, one to two, three to nine, 10 or more. We'll give you just a little bit of time to indicate your answer and hit submit. Okay. Oh, good. All right. Well, this is obviously uh, an interested group. Um, honestly, myself, I, I, I think I've had about six in the last few months. So uh, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm right in there with, uh, with the people in this poll. Okay. All right. So next question, next poll question, do you present active medical management without dialysis as an option to your patients? And if so, how often? Never, uh, only present it as an option if the patient and family explicitly ask it, occasionally present it to selected patients for whom I judge it may be beneficial, present it to all patients who meet certain criteria, age, comorbidities, frailty, dementia, or routinely present it to all patients as one option among many options with information about who may benefit. 
So why don't you indicate which of those more closely matches your practice and hit the submit button. And I would say if you have another way of doing it and you want to chat that in. We'd be interested. Yeah, we'd, we'd, we'd be very interested. Okay. Wow, this is really, I wish, this is wonderful. 42% routinely present it and 42% present it to those patients who meet certain criteria. And really nobody never presents it. All right, so this is an, int we're, we're, we're speaking to, uh, this is not the average uh, group of nephrologists throughout the country. Um, and we, we may get into that a little bit, but the studies show um, that the vast majority of nephrologists do not present it as an option. So when KBGO meant the Kidney Improving Global Options Consensus Conference on uh, Kidney Support of CareMat in 2013, there were a number of work groups. And one of the work groups published an article in CJ's and Clinical Journal of the American Society of Nephrology on supportive care and comprehensive conservative care. And they said that it should be a patient-centered approach that would include interventions to delay progression of chronic kidney disease and treat complications, should include shared decision-making and advanced care planning, should include active pain and symptom management, psychological, social, and family support, and also cultural and spiritual support, but it did not include dialysis. And then to look at this and who might choose active medical management without dialysis. This is a study that was published in the American Journal of Nephrology last year. And although it was only 13 patients, it was more of a qualitative study. I wanna reflect on how their findings really reflect what other two other very much larger studies coming from Vanderbilt uh, showed about uh, patients and patients' attitudes toward uh, dialysis. Um, patients might choose conservative management what they called conservative management because they knew they had limited life expectancy. Notice the average age of these patients was 82 years old. They previously witnessed a relative on dialysis and didn't think that would be a quality of life. They wanted to maintain a good quality of life and they wanted to have a peaceful death. And notice that all died on hospice and Melissa Wachterman and her research team has published several studies that show that, um, that dialysis patients don't die at home. Uh, you know, the, the majority of dialysis patients often do not die at home and most do not die with hospice and don't really receive good end of life care. What the studies from Vanderbilt have shown is that uh, dialysis patients and advanced chronic kidney disease patients value independence more than they value living as long as possible. So quality of life is more important than quantity of life, but to, to figure out which patients feel that way, it's important to ask something like, if you had a serious illness, what would be most important to you in terms of treatment? So we're going to encourage you to maybe think about that. And Desiree, if people are interested, I can send them one of the studies from Vanderbilt where they talk about this serious illness question and using it and what their outcome uh, were. So patient-centered would mean that you find out what's important to patients and you respect it. And in uh, a study, uh, Rachel Morton was the first author, uh, Australian health economist, who really has done, I think, most of her research in uh, with uh, dialysis patients, why patients might value active medical management without dialysis. This agrees with also the, the Vanderbilt study and the study from Rochester, New York, that I just showed you. It allows them freedom to travel, not being tied down to a schedule. They're willing to trade off longer survival for independence. Quality of life was most important. As long as their symptoms were treated, they then didn't have to worry about um, the inconvenience of being in the hospital or being in the dialysis center. So it gave them more hospital free days and there was less impact on their caregivers because many patients didn't want to be a burden to their family. So these are all reasons that patients have given for why they would um, want to um, forego dialysis and go an active medical management route. Now, let me sort of transition into which patients are likely to choose active medical management without dialysis. And this is a Dutch study 
uh, from 2016 that was in CJs, and maybe many of you are familiar with it. Um, they found no survival advantage, no dialysis survival advantage for patients 80 years old or older who started dialysis, and for patients 70 years or older who had significant comorbidities, there was really a limited survival advantage of, I think, six or eight months. It was, uh, it was not a major survival advantage. And so in their conclusions, they said in this single center observational study, there was no statistically significant survival advantage among patients greater, uh, equal to or greater than 80 years old. Comorbidity was associated with a lower survival advantage. And so they encouraged the use of this information in shared decision-making with patients. And then some of you may know Mark Brown, the uh, Australian, sort of the Australian pioneer in renal supportive care at uh, New South Wales. And he published his data. He probably has the largest uh, active medical management without dialysis program in the world, over 3,000 patients. And when he published his experience in 2015 with 122 patients who had active medical management without dialysis versus those who are in a pre-dialysis pathway, he noted that patients choosing active medical management without dialysis are older, notice 82 years old versus 67, had uh, more comorbidities, were less well-nourished, not a difference in their uh, reported physical quality of life or mental quality of life. The mean survival time in months was 20 months for those in his uh, active medical management without dialysis versus 33 months for those in the pre-dialysis pathway. And he noted that the median survival was 16 months, so that over 50, there was over a 50% likelihood of surviving 12 months. So he said, importantly, we have shown that non-dialysis care does not mean imminent death. And these patient symptoms can be managed and quality of life maintained with the help of specialist palliative care. And I should add that Steve Weisbard, who's a nephrologist at Pitt, has shown actually that the symptom burden for those patients managed without dialysis is comparable to those managed with dialysis. Now, this is what we know if you take older patients, this, these were patients 75 and older, and on the right, if they have high comorbidity scores, there was no survival advantage to uh, putting them on dialysis. If they had low comorbidity scores, there clearly was a survival advantage to dialysis. And this is work from Fliss Murtaugh in the United Kingdom. Similar findings, 75 years of age and older, and if they had high comorbidity scores, there was no survival advantage to dialysis. You can see the p-value here of, of 0.98. So if we want to sort of summarize what I've been mentioning and actually just add a little bit more data, when you want to look at what are the prognostic markers, what would be that select population of your advanced CKD patients that you're following that you would want to be sure to mention the option of active medical management without dialysis? If they're 75 or older, and if they have significant comorbidities, or if they have frailty, or if they have functional impairment, some of you may know that Cecile Couchot, who's a French nephrologist who runs the Renal Epidemiology and Information Network, has found that inability to independently transfer was the strongest single predictor of a poor outcome with dialysis and older advanced CKD patients. Cognitive impairment, I think we all know the cognitive impairment is associated with worse survival and dialysis, malnutrition, and the no response to the surprise question. And we'll show you, we showed that that worked in an ethnically uh, uh, diverse, geographically dispersed population in the uh, Pathways Project. So Dale, you wanna take it over here? Yeah, so thanks, Woody. So that's a good description of kind of who and what their, what their um, desires and preferences are. Now we're gonna to turn to what, what would a program look like if you were offering this? And what's, I think the first thing that's important to say is that it's active. Here we say medical management, we've added the active. I've talked to a number of nephrologists and we'll, we'll get into this later who have said, you know, I give people a choice, but then they sort of always end up crashing into dialysis in the last month. So this part of our conversation is, so how do we avoid that? How do we make this option really work for patients? Kay Digo recommends that this option should be part of the entire package of supportive kidney care, and that it shouldn't just be, a, let's say, a 
uh, an afterthought. And we know in the US, this group notwithstanding, that it really is not widely available. Next slide, please. So this is the work, Fliss Murtov, what do you, let's go to the next slide. Oh yeah, yeah, so the uh, option of medical medicine without the house has got a circle around it, okay. <laughs> And, and, and now an arrow, okay, all right, here's the next slide. <laughs> so Fliss Murtaugh showed this trajectory. So when you don't elect dialysis, and, if, and, I would, and I would add, if you're getting good care and are well managed, the trajectory is you don't have that much of a decline. You're sort of going along. And then at the end, you fall off the cliff. And so the key part here of a program, of a protocol for managing these patients, as opposed to just, okay, we're not giving them dialysis, like the do nothing stance, which I know you guys are not doing, but I wanna reemphasize that, is to catch people before they fall off the cliff, to plan for it, to have the safety net in place. So what we're gonna talk about is what is that safety net? Next slide. So here are some of the components, and I know this is a busy slide, making up a lot of, uh, <laughs> we didn't put pretty graphics on it, but just letting you read it, and I will emphasize a couple points. You need to be longitudinally following and closely monitoring. It's Again, it's not just, okay, you decided not to do dialysis, call me when you have problems. It's really having the capacity to um, call in. Some, some clinics that are doing this are calling monthly. They've got a nurse who this is their job is to call monthly to monitor symptoms and to proactively get care in place. You've got to have this robust shared decision-making and advanced care planning. And if you were with us last week in our last uh, webinar, we talked about the difference between shared, shared decision-making being talking about decisions you're making now, advanced care planning being planning for if you, the patient, can't make a decision on your on your, for yourself, who would make it and what do you want them to follow? So you're, you're wanting to have patients and families be thinking ahead and making a plan. There need to be protocols, especially about avoiding hospitalization. So how are you gonna get services into people's homes? Telehealth is a great new tool for this. And how do you deal with the psychosocial problems that crop up, contingency plans? And then in the US, lots of folks are having trouble with getting in the hospice or the in-home palliative care early enough, again, in advance of that crash. Let's go to the next slide. Sorry, sometimes it doesn't advance. There we go. So we called around. This is not a super systematic, but this is the Coalition for Supportive Care of Kidney Patients, sort of who we know. And please chat in. If one of you has an active program, an organized program, and want to get on the radar of the coalition, these are the programs we know about. Again, not, not um, so these are programs where people have defined um, services to patients who go into this pathway. So Jane Shell and Amar Bansal at University of Pittsburgh, Jennifer Sharir at NYU, Fahad Saeed at University of Rochester, Christy Corbett, this is a DNP-led program in Kansas City, Dan Lamb over in Washington, and Holly Konsicki and Emily Liu, Mount Sinai. So again, please chat in if you are doing something and want to get on our radar. We'd love to know about it. Next slide. Can I take it over here? Would that be all right? Yep. yep. All Let's right. So this is, I, you know, Desiree, I think this is something that the RPA should just continue to brag about and brag about. Uh, this, the second edition was published in 2010, but the RPA clinical practice guideline on shared decision-making and the appropriate initiation of a withdrawal from dialysis has really been called the international gold standard for making decisions with patients about dialysis, it's been cited numerous times. Other countries have, have borrowed heavily from this guideline in developing their own guidelines. And there are uh, 10 recommendations with rationales, practical strategies, 
lots of uh, evidence to support it. And if you were not aware of it, or if you don't have it, you can go to the RPA website, which is down at the bottom there on the right, and you can download it for free in PDF form. And I bring this up because as you're talking to your advanced chronic kidney disease patients who might need the description for um, you know, active medical management without dialysis, the first thing is to have this shared decision-making conversation. And just to say the, this, the recommendation is develop a relationship for shared decision-making. And they say it, or we say it in the RPA guideline because it's the recognized preferred model for medical decision-making because it addresses the ethical need to fully inform patients about the risks and benefits in this case of dialysis, as well as the need to ensure that patients' values and preferences play a prominent role. So this would be for those patients that you really believe might be appropriate for active medical management without dialysis, or even just those older patients who might really just value independence and not want to do dialysis, you know, it would be appropriate. Um, it would be appropriate to. Uh, I'm sorry, I forgot to turn my video on. All right, next slide. All right, and here is the American Society of Nephrology uh, recommendation that, uh, that you should not initiate chronic dialysis without a shared decision-making conversation. And this even was back in 2012, where they noted limited observational data, and there now are many more studies since then, including the Dutch study and the Australian study and the Canadian study, limited observational data, which is now not quite so limited, suggesting that survival may, may not differ significantly for older patients with a high burden of comorbidity, okay? So that this is, this is important that you realize not only was it an RPA recommendation, but an ASN recommendation. And then just to sort of say what's involved in, in shared decision-making for patients with advanced CKD, and this is sort of the model, you as the nephrologist provide information about their diagnosis, their prognosis, uh, you know, with and without dialysis, the treatment options, the patient tells you what's important to them, uh, you make sure that the patient understands the information and that you understand what's important to the patient. And then you discuss all options for treatment, including kidney transplant if the patient's a candidate, home dialysis, either hemo or PD, in center, and also active medical management without dialysis. And this is what Dale was saying. This is what uh, Kay Digo was saying as well, that this is certainly that you something you should bring up, especially, I might say, for your older patients. And the whole concept of patient-centered care, you know, uh, CMS is talking about it, the Institute of Medicine is talking about it. When we talk about value-based kidney care, again, it's to be patient-centered. And the definition really comes from the Institute of Medicine. It was, it's now the National Academy of Medicine, but it was called the Institute of Medicine back in 2001 when this report came out. So patient-centered care, in case you haven't heard the formal definition, is care that's respectful of and responsive to individual patient preferences, needs, and values, and ensures that patients' values guide all clinical decisions. And the observation that many people have been making in the 21st century is that we should stop being disease-oriented in our focus and become patient-centered. And this is from, a, 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 I think, a perspective in the American Journal of Medicine in 2004, where Mary Tonetti and her colleagues at Yale wrote, the time has come to abandon disease as the primary focus of patient care. Medical care must evolve once again to a more individually tailored integrated model based on the healthcare needs of patients in the 21st century. And as I alluded to already, and Dale did as well, the only way we're gonna know what's important to patients, what are their values, preferences, and goals is to ask, and that's where the shared decision-making conversation that's been recommended by the RPA and the ASN comes in. And why is, and I think this may be my last one back to you, Dale, but why is it patient-centered? It's because it's asking, um, what matters most to you. It's not focused on the disease process. It's focused more on what's important to the patient. And just, let me just, this looks a lot like the chronic kidney disease trajectory, doesn't it? The one Dale showed. And this is the whole idea that patients will have, deter you know, intermittent blips where they'll be hospitalized and they won't ever quite get to where they were. And then this is sort of the downhill trajectory of people with a life-limiting illness. And the point is that if we've talked to patients, 
in stage two when they're diagnosed with progressive CKD that then we will know their wishes and they won't crash into dialysis. It will have been discussed in advance whether they want dialysis, don't want dialysis. And if they don't want dialysis, you really have to have a plan in place because as I've talked to Sarah Davison in Canada and Mark Brown in Australia and other nephrologists who have successful uh, active medical management without dialysis programs, they say, if your patient doesn't know what to do when they become symptomatically uremic, other than go to the emergency department, your program is not gonna be successful. All right, so let's go to this poll and then um, Dale, I'll have you pick it up after this. So yeah, so, so we, we've talked about, I'll, I'll do the poll question. We, we've sure. talked about, you know, why do it? And yeah, there's lots of prestigious groups have saying do it, but it's, it's hard to do. It hasn't been part of standard, the way standard, especially CKD practices are organized. So we'd like to know from you guys and you guys are doing it. Um, What's the main barrier you've encountered? So here's four that we've proposed, patients change their mind and they want dialysis when their symptoms escalate. And I've said the end of life is in sight, you know, mortality rears up. Or two, patients go to the ER or the hospital and there the ER and ICU team convinces them to start dialysis, maybe without a lot of discussion, maybe just saying, oh, your kidney is failing, we can treat that, you know? Um, Family members are uncomfortable with decision and persuade patients to start, or you haven't been able to get in the kinds of support, home palliative care or hospice care that would really support people um, and keep them from going to the ER. So what what are you, all, some people say all of the above I'm seeing in a chat. Yeah, yeah. yeah. okay. Um, to give uh, All of above is fair. If there's one that's really bugging you, you can, uh, say that, but so let's and keep chatting in the others. And Got another all of the above in the chat. Yeah. All right, let's see the results. All right, patients changing their mind is almost half of the significant barrier, all right? And then the ER, and family members. Okay, so really you're seeing patient and family issues with this. Okay, thank you, that's helpful to know. Let's go to the next slide. So again, here are the the, um, the components of a program. Did I skip one? Yes. Yeah, and we talked about these and I'm gonna go, we're now gonna go, I'm, let's go to the next slide. Let's, let's gloss over that slide, go to the next slide. This is the work that the Pathways Group did. So there were three CKD clinics who came together in a work group and said, yeah, we want to do more medical management, but it's not working. And they were talking about the same things you just said, that people are crashing into the ER or, or ER teams, put them on dialysis, let, let, you know, they have somebody go to the hospital over the weekend and they come in on Monday morning and they're on dialysis. You know, what happened? <laughs> it wasn't you know, an intern or a fellow who did it. So we got this group together and we all said, what can, how can we develop something that will be more workable? And it, this quote unquote pathway, this medical management pathway and toolkit came out of it. I wanna say that we built this very much on the work of Sarah Davison and their, um, their work in Alberta. Even the uh, figures here come are taken from them. So they thought about what they call CKM, conservative kidney management. They thought about these stages. So thinking about when someone's stable, when they're kind of declining, and then the rapid decline. And that you need to do different things in each of those stages, but you need to start when they're stable. Next slide. And this is what our work group said you should be doing in these, and, and our work group actually defined the four stages, a steep decline, and then actually the end of life period. So in that stable period, you need to be planning. And that's planning with patient and family. And that's probably the main thing that can help address what you, you all said were, were, were the big problems, which is patient changing their mind. Now, if a patient legitimately changes their mind, that's fine. Mark Brown says about 
it's it's less than 10% of his patients change their mind. Um, and it I might think, be higher. Yeah, it was like three out of 200 or three out of 300. And Sarah Davison says the same thing. She says, if she's really talked to patients and it's, you know, then they don't panic at the end. They know what they're doing instead of going to the emergency department. So then in moderate decline, you're going to be trying to manage. So you're managing symptoms, but you're managing the psychosocial issues. This is where you're doing deep advanced care planning and setting up how are you going to get hospice or palliative care in. Steep decline, you're getting those intensive services in, and then end of life, you're you're managing end of life. We've got a we've got a good question here um, about how do we get more palliative care, and so let's we'll address that at the end because it's a that's a big question that that is going to need some policy help. Let's go to the next slide. So what's in each of these stages? So our work group defines specific things that should be in a, a, a comprehensive medical management program. The shaded yellow ones are the ones that the typical CKD pl clinic doesn't have available, you know, doesn't have resources or staff for. And so I won't read all of these, but I, I point out a couple. So one is in planning to have patient education material that really describes active medical management objectively. A lot of the material that's available and that we have looked like looked at has very it very subtly sort of disses active medical management. It will sort of it might give one paragraph to it and talk about it as like you don't have to do anything. You can do this or um, it, they're, they're subtle, not objective, not not patient-friendly ways of describing it. So look at your material very carefully. Again, the material uh, on the web, freely available from Sarah Davison's group, ckm.com, I think, um, okay. is they have, they have very good material. And this is when you're engaging families. And again, you wanna bring in people with the, the social work capacity or who have some time to sit down and, and, and help families think through this. And then you want to designate who these patients are in your EMR. You want a flag. You don't want, once someone has made this decision, you don't want every single person who touches them to be trying to redo the decision with them. One thing, you and I haven't talked about this, but one thing that's come up in some new research is a, a group of patients that we might think about as waiting to decide. They want to be on, um, uh, uh, they think they want to be on a medical management plan, but they're not quite sure. And so there is a group of people who are still thinking about it, but not ready to, they're not exactly the, I'm, I'm waiting for dialysis. They, they are kind of a waiting to decide group and you might want to handle them a little differently. We don't have much research around that. And then here in that management, these are the services and the activities that need to happen. So I told you about Christy Corbett has a nurse practitioner led clinic. And this is what she's doing when she's seeing patients either every month or quarterly, depending on what they need. They're going through doing the advanced care planning. They're making sure that case management is available. They're introducing contingency plans, and we have some documents that um, in our toolkit that, that you give to a patient. This is the, um, the contingency action plan if you have these symptoms. This is what you take with you when you go to the, the emergency room. We built that what do you take with you off of the green, what's called the green sleeve in Canada, um, which is a take with you this letter and show it to everybody who's treating you. That, you know, I've had a discussion with my nephrologist and I don't want dialysis, here's some other things. Call my, call my nephrologist so that you don't wake up on Monday morning to find three of your patients have suddenly been crashed into dialysis. And then intensive support, this is where we're setting up that safety net um, and increasing the frequency of contact with patients. And of course, at end of life, also bereavement is something that nephrology providers don't have capacity and resources for, but should be happening along with hopefully community hospice. So that's a lot. I mean, I, that's a lot to say, oh my God, you should just go set this up. Well, of course, you're not going to probably do all of it overnight, but you could pick one or two of these things and begin 
to look at how do I work this into what we do in our CKD clinic. Um, next slide, Woody. We've developed a toolkit and I don't have a picture of it, but it, we do at the end have the link. It's downloadable, it's free. And it has a bunch of the things that if you take these and begin to implement them, as I said, not probably not all at once, but a little bit at a time. These are some of the pieces that are, that are in there. There are some suggestions around decision aids. There's a, a booklet based on the Alberta booklet for patients. There are um, action guides for patients. They're, they're the, the pieces to take with you to the hospital. There's a letter to send to other providers saying that your patient has made this decision. Um, so a lot of very practical tools. And I think, do I have another slide or am I going, sending it to uh, you? So I, yeah, I think I'll pick this up. So one of the things there, so if we're doing shared decision-making, one of the things is that patients might want to start dialysis, but not for an indefinite period of time. They might have a granddaughter getting married in two months and they really want to live for that or for a grandchild to be born or for, you know, for some other life event. And um, so they may start dialysis, but really they're not interested in having the best quality metrics for dialysis. They really want to be alive for this uh, major life event. Or you may have, this is part of this shared decision-making. So I know this is an active medical management without dialysis, but you may have patients already on dialysis and you may really think they are dying, they're terminally ill and they have less than a year to live. And they may talk to you just as I shared with you earlier, that more important to them than coming to dialysis three days a week for four hours at a time, more important to them than the absolute best uh, URR or KT over V, the best dialysis index, is to have time to uh, do things with friends and family, life closure. It could be they're just worn out and that it just wears them out too much to come to dialysis three times a week. They've already agreed to a limited treatment plan. They're not going to have CPR. They don't want to go to the ICU. They don't want to be on a ventilator. Um, so they really are emphasizing time with family, being comfortable, having the independence, maybe traveling a little bit more as they're able. So palliative dialysis, um, uh, you know, I don't know if that's currently in your toolbox of things that you think about. I can tell you when we started the Pathways Project, um, Pathways Project uh, probably two years ago, thereabouts, uh, the nephrologists who were participating, we had 11 dialysis centers around the country, and, uh, you know, maybe only one or two patients out of the 11 dialysis centers total were on palliative dialysis. And by the time we were done, I think eight of the dialysis centers were offering not to a huge number of patients, maybe one or two at a time, but just after talking to patients and finding out what was important, they realized that palliative dialysis really was a good way to provide value-based kidney care to those patients. The other thing that you may want to consider when you're starting a patient on dialysis is either a time-limited trial of dialysis or even a time-limited trial of palliative dialysis. And these are for patients who aren't quite ready to say, no, I don't want dialysis, but I, um, I want to try it and see if this is something I really want to do or not. So um, if they don't already have a, a graft or a fistula, these would be people where you would put a, a tunnel cuff catheter uh, and where you would indiv individualize your, your plan of care. Now, I hear you saying, what about the ESRD quality incentive program? Or what about the, the penalty to the dialysis center if your metrics aren't good? And so we are working with CMS, but I think you all know it's not a uh, speedy process. We're even talking the RPA Quality Safety and Accountability Committee already has had one discussion about this and how we might talk to kidney care partners and then go back to CMS and talk about this. But what we've been told with the 11 dialysis centers we were working with is one patient isn't going to mess up your quality metrics uh, to the point where you would, you know, you would, you would take a, a, a penalty. Um, so at any rate, so what would palliative dialysis look like? It would be somebody who comes one to three times a week, either for a shorter period of time or just fewer treatments per week. Uh, you might not be using quite as many meds as you would otherwise use. 
It's not for, um, it's not a uh, bridge to transplant. These are obviously not your patients who are bridged to transplant. These are not even really, uh, you know, these are patients who are on what we call destination dialysis. And we know that it's really, there's a short time left. Um, and so you, you look at all these things, if you can get home-based palliative care, if you can do a hospice referral because the patient has a non-kidney related terminal diagnosis and the hospices in your area will, will pick up dialysis patients, continuing dialysis if they're dying from lung cancer or something of that nature, then you can look at these other options as well. And if at the result, as a result of doing a time limited trial, they were satisfied and they want to do it for another month, then you could potentially do it for another month. Obviously, this is really tailoring the care to what the patient wants, but we're all very concerned about what will, what will you know, regulators say and how will this affect you financially, and we're all still working this out. But this certainly is going to be part of, I think, value-based kidney care in the future. So if we sort of want to look at this, there's a time-limited trial of dialysis for patients who aren't sure they want to do it to just evaluate what it's like. And that would be a regular treatment schedule, but maybe to reevaluate at the end of a month or three months to see how it's going and if they want to consider. There's palliative dialysis for patients who are already on dialysis, but are clearly doing poorly and want to back off on dialysis as they're approaching the end of life and focus on other things. And then there's even a time-limited trial of palliative dialysis. So we're giving you lots of different options in addition to active medical management without dialysis. If you're really trying to tailor your care to the patient based on the patient's uh, values and goals. Dale, back to you. Yeah, so how do you do all of this? Again, how do you do all of this? So first of all, and I think you guys being here you, the, your responses to the poll question, as Wei said, you're not the typical audience. I'm sure some of you have seen the research or know the third of your nephrology colleagues who just absolutely do not agree with offering this um, for, for a lot of reasons, F either feel uncomfortable or feel ethically that really dialysis should be offered to everyone. Um, so really clarifying that it is an acceptable standard of care. And we have to, we're not there yet because we haven't said what the standard of care for this would look like. Again, emphasizing it's not just not doing it dialysis, it's bringing all these other elements into play. It's very important that there be some kind of 24 seven support for patients. Of course, this is very hard and a taxing for a CKD clinic to set up but it's not impossible. And as we move forward to trying to figure out how this is gonna get paid for, how you put this into value-based payment structures, this is a key element. You know, If the only way that people can get help with shortness of breath at two in the morning is go to the ER, they're gonna to go to the ER and they should. So you've gotta have some, some way that they can get in touch with you. Um, Again, we need to make this more visible nationally so that people know that it's an option and, and then can actually get it near them. And we need to do a lot more research on you know, what works, what the barriers are. We're just beginning to learn about this in the US. And we're building on Australia, Canada, and, and Britain, Great Britain. Next slide, Woody. Sure, and as I'm transitioning to the next slide, what we've learned from our colleagues in Canada and Australia is that if patients know there's a clinic Monday through Friday where they could call if they had symptoms, they could call, they can just wait till the morning rather than going to the ED in the middle of the night knowing they could call at eight o'clock in the morning and talk to the nurse and figure out what they should do. So again, we there's a lot that needs to happen on the policy and to make a more regulatorily friendly and payment friendly, we need to do that. We need lots more research about how to actually do this. We need guidelines that are more flexible. Um, yeah, we've talked about all of these. So let's go to the next slide. Okay, all right. So I think that our what the take homes from uh, the experience of our colleagues in the UK, Canada and Australia about 15% of patients who they offer this are choosing it. So, you know, this is not everyone. And also, as I said, there may be this middle group of, of uh, kind of waiting to decide who may need 
even a little adjusting of how we approach them. These patients, you know, you don't have to present this as you're gonna die next month. They, on average, are gonna live longer than a year. And in that year, they need primary, what we call primary palliative care. So they need the nephrology team able to support symptoms, both physical and psychological. The geriatric syndromes really predict who may not benefit from dialysis. As Woody said, remember the inability to transfer, any other kinds of frailty. And this is not typically, as my understanding, it's not typically part of the nephrology workup, but we need to begin probably to do that. It's learning how to talk about this to patients. So presenting it as holistic care, or this is sort of natural aging, as opposed to, we're not gonna do something we could have done for you, right? So don't talk about it as, do you wanna not do dialysis? That's, and so consciously find the words to talking about, this is a program that we have to support you that will manage your symptoms, will help you feel as good as possible without having to go to the dialysis center, without having to have dialysis. Um, and there are risk algorithms that you can use that have been developed. Yeah, and Dale, before we go to the next slide, I wanna point out natural aging, notice that's the British spelling because it's the British who talk about that and have some very successful active medical management without dialysis programs. Do you wanna talk about palliative care here? Remember there was that question about yes. how do we access palliative Thank you. care? Yes, so uh, let's see, we've got a question. How do you suggest approaching palliative care to be more involved in our patient ESRD and CKD? We need to establish more of a relationship with them, but at what points would it be most useful to have them intervene? This is so great. So first of all, I think you have to establish some programmatic relationships and have some talks and approach it with them as I would say a, a joint experiment. Um, work on some, you know, ask your palliative care colleagues, what do they think they can help you with? Tell them what you think you need help with. One of the experiences from England is they, is they were uh, referring people to their community palliative care and the community of palliative care, or they were referring them early and their community palliative care were saying, well, these patients don't need anything from us. And so they weren't really following them. And then we had that crash. So you may have to educate your palliative care colleagues. This is what needs to get put in place. And we're, we're on this like high alert, watchful waiting to try to catch people before the crash. Um, so I, you're asking well, what points would it be most useful to have them intervene? I think it's at the beginning when someone um, is, is making this decision, you want them to get to know the palliative care team. Uh, you want maybe a consult where you all talk. And then at the point, it, so then you need to decide, is it you, the nephrology team or the palliative care team who's gonna do this, this watchful monitoring? And that's, we don't know which is best, um, but somebody needs to be monitoring pretty frequently, monthly, every other month, just at least just check-in calls. And then obviously palliative care team should help you with symptoms or with more complex psychosocial. So if you've got real family conflict, family un uncomfortable with this decision, your palliative care team might be able to help you there. Um, and then just responding that, oh my God, yes, it's a real problem that hospice in much of the country cannot or will not for whatever, the, the whole complex of policy and payment reasons um, take people who are on palliative care dialysis or are, have lost their, their experience, like no longer know how to take care of, of end-stage renal patients. So I think finding a hospice that wants to embark on this with you doesn't necessarily have to be concurrent hospice dialysis for this group, but it's really, getting them in early, have, helping, having them identify, you know, when can they do informational visits, setting up the relationship so that letting, having patients know that they can call them, you know, use their, their on-call service. And, you know, those are things you would, you would work out programmatically. Right. Dale, there's one other one that's very practical that I want to mention too. The research has shown that nephrologists rarely request palliative care consults on hospitalized seriously ill patients. I think it was what, 2% of patients or something like that who had been in the hospital for more than two days. And so I would also strongly encourage you, if you wouldn't be surprised if, if you know, your, your dialysis patient who's in the hospital would die in the next six months to year, 
consider having the palliative care team see them for shared decision making, advanced care planning, sort of a review of their uh, symptoms to see if you can improve their quality of life by addressing some symptoms and also put some advanced care planning in place. And maybe they will help you identify, um, uh, you know, patients who, who, uh, who maybe would want uh, a less aggressive approach. The other thing is your advanced CKD patients, when they're hospitalized, again, it would be a good time uh, to, uh, you know, to perhaps get them involved to help with uh, discussions about which course the patient wants to take. But of course, the limitation of a hospital-based palliative care is that they may not be following people out into the community. And that's where we need to build a much more robust set of services. Woody, there's a, there's a chat question that's for you. Right, what about the ESA, erythropoietin stimulating yeah. agents. Yeah, and so this is a tough one. I admit this is a tough one. Um, we've had patients who've occasionally gotten ESAs on hospice, but I can tell you hospices really don't like doing it. And so it sometimes has been something that's led to a, uh, a later referral to hospice. Certainly you don't need to keep their hemoglobin at nine and a half or 9.8. Um, and sometimes patients are very accepting of getting a lower dose less often, or they may even get to a point where they don't really feel when they get a shot that it makes a difference. Some patients really do get a boost, but others don't. And when they're really getting tired, they just may not want to go through the bother of continuing to get the shots. But that's something again, that you have to discuss out with them or your nurse practitioner potentially could do it or, or your nurse, but it's, uh, it's something really that's, uh, you know, that's a, a give and take and a discussion. But um, I, I agree that it can be something that does delay the referral to hospice for a patient for whom ESAs are very important. Yeah. And what do we have earlier up in the chat? We've got um, a question which I couldn't even begin to answer. Conservative care in the 60s with sodium modeling. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Richard Hamburger put that one in. Yeah. I, you know, Richard was one decade ahead of me. I, I read all the articles. But yes, you can treat, um, uh, you know, uh, chronic kidney disease, advanced chronic kidney disease with diet, with careful diet. And uh, we even used to use diarrhea, Richard. I remember reading articles about diarrhea therapy for uremia. I don't think any of us uh, really want to get go down that route. But um, Richard's right that you can certainly look more carefully if you're going to do palliative dialysis once a week or if the patient doesn't really want to do um, dialysis and you're doing active medical management, you could look at diet as a way to help keep them from getting fluid overloaded and symptomatic um, sooner. Uh, you want to mention these resources, Dale? Yes. So a couple things. One is the book that we've edited recently from Oxford University Press. And whoops, go back one. Yep. Sorry. I was clicking to see yep. a chat comment. And anyway, so not to push our book, but just to say it is a comprehensive resource. We've got a chapter on medical management. There's lots of stuff on symptom management. Then in the box below it is this toolkit I've been saying we developed. I would highly recommend you go there, go.gwu.edu slash A-M-M-W-D. It's a whole toolkit. It has patient information. It has you know, a letter for patients to take with them to the, all the things I've been talking about. It has a template for your medical records, lots of tools in there. Uh, our recent article that described our pathways um, intervention doesn't talk so much about the medical management because that came out after, that came as we were working with the CKD clinics, but if you're interested, and we've been publishing and presenting results at ASN and RPA and all over, and we'll have some articles soon. Um, next slide has some more of the links. Again, this, this toolkit, but also in what we call the change package from Pathways. We have a number of chapters. There's, there's several pages each, just a few pages each. They're called, best, each is a best practice. So here we've picked out the ones that you really should look at. Best practices, um, nine, and I can't see it under my chat. Is that 10, Woody? Can't see nine it. Nine and 14. Nine and 14, thank you. Um, so look, going right to that part of the, the long change package, there are resources. We point you to the CKM website, to, to um, share decision-making materials, lots of, of good resources there. 
Right, um, and, and, and Desiree is emailing if she hasn't already, and so they should have access, right? Desiree, did you already send them the PDFs on this? Yes, I did send the presentation out about an hour before um, our webinar. So if anyone didn't get it, um, just shoot me an email. I'll be happy to resend it again. We've got, we, there are more really good questions, Woody. Um, okay. One, what what can we do about, or sort of saying, I can't do anything about shortness of breath at 2 a.m. and got to send with the ER. Right. Yeah. Under the current system, yes, that's true. But we have to, if you were going to go in value-based, you know, have some, if you're building some new programs, what would help you do that? So hospices deal with shortness of breath at two in the morning. They have nurses who go out. What can we in the nephrology community do? How do we deliver care to patients? Can, you, can there be emergency kits of the medications they would need in their homes? Let, you know, let's really think creatively about how to be proactive. People how to work, yeah, how to work with community palliative care, which often is an arm of the hospice. And maybe those patients will have oxygen in the home that they could put on if they were to get shorter breath. Or maybe they could do a little bit of oxycodone liquid concentrate like morphine, but we can't use morphine in dialysis patients, but a little bit of oxycodone sometimes takes away the shortness of breath. Um, there's then... <laughs> Two more good questions. Can I take this one? Yes. So in the hospital, you often see older patients with multiple comorbidities who, um, and the question is how to present active medical management without dialysis in that setting, because it's really, uh, you know, a late diagnosis. Maybe they weren't aware they had end stage kidney disease. I think everybody probably on this webinar may know that if you're starting an older patient on dialysis who has comorbid conditions in the hospital, they have a very poor prognosis. The studies suggest they may live seven months and they may send, spend two or three of those months in the hospital. And so I think really you would present it as the research shows there's very limited benefit from starting dialysis, a hospital start of dialysis in an older patient with comorbidities. And I think you just sort of have to say, I often say to patients and families, um, would you like me to just tell you, would you like me to sugarcoat it? Uh, or would you like me to tell you the truth about likely outcomes? And I don't talk, talk them out of it, but I just say, you may not live any longer with dialysis than without dialysis. But if we start dialysis, you're gonna need an access. You're gonna need to come to the unit three times a week. You're gonna need to stay there for four hours at a time. And often patients, especially older patients, uh, prefer the um, uh, less burdensome uh, active medical management without dialysis. Um, I would also refer back to our last presentation and say this is where Ask Till Ask comes in. All right. Um, I'm thankful to uh, Mukesh Sharma wrote that meaningful changes to the CMS QUIP are definitely the need of the hour. I completely agree. And I think Renee Garrett is on the phone, who's also on the RPA uh, Quality Safety and Accountability Committee. We're working on that, but I appreciate you saying that that's important. Uh, because I agree and we're working on it. But thank you for bringing it up. Um, other, okay, now that we've got another one. Needs to be awareness amongst your colleagues, cardiologists, yes, PCPs, yes, absolutely. And that's, and, and I've certainly heard that from patients and, and either, even from nephrologists that there'll be a decision made, but then it'll be represented, maybe not so skillfully, um, in the ICU or by, by other people will really push the patient to reconsider. And giving people information is one thing, but really questioning them over and over and over again. There, I'm forgetting, there's a study of VA patients who chose medical management and it shows, they, they went into their charts and it shows that people were asked over and over and over again to reconsider the decision, which is not, you don't ask dialysis patients every time they come in, are you sure you want to do dialysis? Yeah. You know, that's it, that, that undermines it. Right. So yes, you need to educate the whole community. This is an informed group, if you recall our polling questions. So that data, which really is pretty, pretty solid and pretty consistent about which patients are not likely to benefit from dialysis, Hopefully everybody, you know, participating in this webinar will educate their colleagues, educate, uh, you know, the intensivists, the cardiologists, the primary care physicians, because 
Uh, we don't really want this to be clinical momentum or a uh, de, de facto default, you know, falling or crashing into dialysis. We really want it to be something where people have had an opportunity to think about it in advance and have had options that they don't end up on dialysis when really they're not likely to do well with it. Okay, I think we've used up our hour, Desiree. You're on mute. That's right, you're on mute. We have one more. Did you want to take this last one? Sure, sure. Or Dr. Moss, about the monogram health model? Uh, let's see. The monogram health model is seeking to delay the progression of disease and promote a seamless transition to palliative care and hospice by providing in-home medical management. Have you heard of this new business line? So I haven't heard of it, but it sounds like a good idea to me. I think, you know, a lot of people have been critical of, of you know, the nephrology community and not doing a greater job in, in trying to delay or prevent the progression of disease. Probably everybody on this webinar is doing it, but I think there are a lot of, especially primary care physicians too, who don't even know about use of ACE inhibitors and good blood pressure control. Um, and uh, yeah, so if somebody wants to write to us, it looks like I'm looking at this chat thing. Yeah. Um, tell them to, to feel yeah. free to email us. You can, and Desiree, maybe can you put in the chat our emails for everyone? Um, um, well, what I can do, this probably, this is going to close soon. I can, if, since you guys are okay with that, I'll go ahead and send that out to the group um, yeah. right after we finish so that Good. people Good. can follow up with you. But we are at the top of the hour. So thank you all so much for your participation. Thank you to Dr. Moss and Dr. Lupu for a great uh, presentation. Definitely informative. And I hope you guys will join us for our final segment, Evidence-Based Approaches to Treating Symptoms in Patients with Kidney Disease. That'll be next Wednesday same time, 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, and I will be sending out uh, the webinar login information two days prior. So what you'll be sure to address breathlessness at two in the morning. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so definitely tune in. So thank you all so much. Have a great afternoon and um, look for an email from me when the recording is up in case you missed, you know, a few minutes or had to leave. And I'll also include the emails um, for, for our presenters. So thank you so much, everyone. Thank, thank you. Bye-bye.